Good to see everyone here. Um, why, don't, why don't we start with you and then we'll jump to me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, also a warm hello from me. It's, it's great to be here with all of you. It's my first time at a FIRST conference. Um, and Nina and I, we, we, actually, we also met last night for the very first time, uh, despite planning this keynote together over the last several weeks. And we thought we might just kind of warm things up by sharing a little bit about who we are and, and what we do, so you get a sense of where we're coming from on this. Did you want to kick us off? Sure, sure. Um, so I have a really long title currently, um, but, but sort of in shorter terms, the, Department of, the US Department of Defense has a research and engineering office, and there is a, a woman who leads that office. Her name is Heidi Shu. She's a sort of a four-star general, general equivalent, and so that's, that's my boss currently, and I help advise her on what we call critical or emerging technologies, and a huge part of that involves computers and, and cyber issues, and so that's what I do for her currently. Um, but then, uh, you know, sort of, I think anybody who's in this room who's sort of around my age um, has come into this space probably from other spaces. When we were growing up, we didn't, uh, there, there were no, no programs or classes or certifications just yet, and so, so we're all sort of feral, right? We come into this from different spaces, and so um, in addition to the work I do uh, for the Department of Defense, um, and then prior to that, the Navy, uh, just being part of the hacker community and sort of more on that kind of, kind of um, edgier, weirder part of the community. Um, and so currently I do what we call a maritime industrial control system work. Um, and so if you're going to DEF CON this year, you'll see us there on the floor, and I invite you to come uh, play, play with us this year, Maritime ICS. So that's who I am, um, if you want to go. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think you'll already see that we have quite different backgrounds, which is also a great demonstration of why diversity is uh, so important. So. My day job, I actually just started a new day job with the Stimson Center a few months ago, so I'll, I'll say a few words about that, but then I'll also say a few words about my previous day job as well, because I think it's relevant to what we're talking about today. Um, I'm implementing and leading a project at the Stimson Center, which is a think tank based in Washington, D.C. I'm a proud Canadian, however, living in Toronto at the moment. Um, and we're focusing on accountability in cyberspace, and that's mainly focusing on states and governments in relation to international law and the international threat landscape. Um, but of course, we're also looking at how non-governmental stakeholders have a role to play in that too. But prior to coming to Stimson, I worked for several years with um, a quite uh, lefty, radical feminist organization, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the world's oldest feminist peace organization. And I worked in their disarmament program uh, in which we included international cybersecurity. And we really, uh, what WILF does in all of its work is bring a gender and a feminist lens to its work in security issues. So that's very much kind of where I'm coming from uh, with things today. So I thought maybe just to kind of get things warmed up, I know it's early in the morning, talking about gender and diversity might be like a bit of a heavy topic if you haven't had enough coffee yet. Um, I'm glad to see that the room is full. I hope it stays that way. Um, but yeah, so we've got kind of just a few kind of like opening bits that we kind of wanted to run through. Um, and I noted that the theme of this year's conference is empowering communities, which is really what a conversation about gender diversity is all about. Diversity and empowerment are powerfully interconnected, and with diversity and empowerment, the community overall becomes stronger. So I've got kind of four opening points that I wanted to make. Um, these are just kind of to help us, yeah, start thinking in a very general way. What do we mean when we're talking about gender, when we're talking about diversity, and maybe to get us start thinking, to start us thinking a little bit about some of our assumptions and some of our habits. So first, Gender diversity is not a women's issue, it is an everyone issue. And I want to repeat that, that gender diversity is not a women's issue alone, it is an everyone issue. And that's because gender, yes, it is about women and about femininities, but it's also about men and masculinities. It's also about non-binary folks, it's about sexual orientations. And the point is that not just one of us can fix the inequalities between genders. It's not something that only women should be trying to work on. We also need male allies in this work. It really requires getting everyone involved. 
And the second kind of little opening point here is that we are all, and, and I, I certainly do this too, perpetuating gender stereotypes all the time without even realizing it. So for example, while it might seem like a compliment to say that women are more cooperative and men are more competitive, these are stereotypes. And they paint all people of the same gender with the same brush, overlooking that there really are no traits, behaviors, or preferences that are necessarily common to everyone, to all women, or to all men that all men share. A third point, that gender diversity, it is diverse. Not all women experience the same forms of discrimination, and not all men enjoy the same privileges. It's really important to also think about how our gender identities intersect with other identities, like race, age, ethnicity, <coughs> class, income, ability, sexual orientation, to create unique patterns of discrimination and exclusion. And then finally, I just want to say a few words about equal representation versus fair representation, because I think this is going to be really relevant for our talk today. And I'm going to use an example. If an image has an equal number of men and an equal number of women in it, but all the men are firefighters and all the women are nurses, then this image, while equal in number, it's still helping to perpetuate socially constructed gender roles. And this kind of goes back to the stereotypes that I mentioned earlier. And I think a lot of the above, what I've just talked about, you know, these are things that maybe we don't notice or think about or question very often. They are often ingrained behaviors. And I know that they also vary quite a lot in different countries and cultures around the world. And if you're someone who isn't adversely affected because of your gender identity or your other identities, you're probably then even less likely to be thinking about this regularly. But the one sort of universal tool that we have to start putting this on our radar and thinking more closely about these issues in our personal lives and in our professional lives is a gender analysis. And I know probably this sounds like really complex or really academic, but really it's just about asking questions. And I'm gonna borrow here from Cynthia Enlow, who is a renowned feminist thinker. She coined the term feminist curiosity to make this point that it's just about asking questions and noticing patterns around you. Where are the women in a given situation? Where are the men? Is there space for people who are gender diverse or non-conforming? What are they doing? What are the power dynamics? Who holds the resources? Who speaks most often? Who speaks most loudly? And again, these are very, very simple questions and observations, but I, I've also felt that once you start noticing these things and thinking about them, you can't really unsee them. Wow. <laughs> this is so much of what Allison said now just um, has a, we, so one, it's, I think neither of us sort of is on a circuit giving a lot of <clears throat> gender and diversity talks. Most of us, you know, so we're both sort of, professional nerds, and so we do a lot of research in, in, in our day jobs, and so, um, but, but all the points, uh, I can't help but tell a story. So, um, so I work, you know, I, I think it's no surprise that when you work in a, in, in a sort of a national security space, which of which you are all a part, um, but also the Department of Defense, which is, I'm going to shock you here, it's deeply gendered, um, you, you find yourself in situations where uh, nobody else knows what's happening but you, right? So looking around and you're watching it happen, and so um, what does that feel like? What does it look like? And then, and then what do we want to do about it? What do we want to do about it is, by the way, the next panel, so, so definitely stay tuned. Um, but one of the things that I often tell my colleagues is that fish don't know the color of the water in which they swim, which is a common anthropological, I'm not an anthropologist, but I borrow from them all the time, but it's a common anthropological thing, and so, um, so several years ago, I was part of a, of a, of a bilateral exchange with uh, uh, the Chinese Navy. So the Chinese would send their counterparts to the United States, and we would um, sit and do very formal things, and then, and then we, we go over to China. And so we're sitting across the table, and these are very formal diplomatic affairs, but it doesn't mean they're not, um, they're, they're not scripted. They're often sort of competitive and adversarial. Um, because we're, we're competing navies. And so we're sitting at this dinner, and, um, and if you've been to sort of these formal diplomatic um, events, there's the, there is the dinner 
which there is a lot of drinking. And so we're in China, so there's, a, there's like gallons of what they call Mao Tai. So we're there, and I don't really like Mao I'm an accomplished <coughs> drinker. Hi, Mom. Um, I'm an accomplished <laughs> drinker, so I think I'm fine, right? I think I'm fine, but I've never had this particular liquor before. And so I am at the diplomatic table. I've got three of my counterparts, and we are facing a bunch of sort of uh, Chinese generals, literally, and they've got their counterparts. And there are two carafes at the table. There's a giant carafe, and then there's a little tiny cup. And then we fill the little tiny cup, and we do a, a toast, right, to, your, to the strength of your navy, the strength of my navy. May we never meet on the battle, and we all drink, right? Fine, fine, it's fine, right? And so I'm like, I can do this. Uh, I'm a bourbon drinker, we can do it. And um, I look around, and I'm, I am the only woman at the front table. And in fact, there are no other women at the, in the, just, Right? But in the back, in the back, there is, there is a, a Chinese woman who is, uh, I, think she's, I think she's someone's um, executive assistant or, right? And so, um, so we start doing the toasts and, they, and, the, and it, all of a sudden everybody can't figure out what to do because it's my turn. And we're not quite sure what, the, what does this mean because I'm supposed to toast to a counterpart. So they take her from the back of the room and they put her at the table. And this poor woman, right, who's completely unprepared for any of this and who clearly does not drink, is now front and center and being asked to take, take the shots of Mao Tai. So, so, I, so I'm nervous for her. I'm, I'm a little bit worried because I don't like the taste of this liquor. It smells like foot. I'm not excited. <laughs> uh, and then there's this part where when you're really trying to demonstrate bravado, um, you, inst you, you, you pour it into the little cup, and then what you do is you hold up the carafe, and then you drink the carafe, and you, you dare your counterpart to do it too. So what am I going to do? So, so I've got this poor woman who's been brought from the back of the room, and she's, and she's my counterpart. I don't know why she's my counterpart. She's clearly not my counterpart, but they didn't know what to do. My colleagues had no what. All of a sudden, everybody's seeing the gender, right? And on top of it, that poor, the poor person doesn't drink. So, but well before, well before any of this was happening, when they moved her forward, I turned to the server and I said, can you please, because Mao Tai is clear, can you please put water in her carafe? So we switched out her carafe with pure water. And so when I stood up, and when she stood up, we did the little shot. And then I took my carafe, foot smell and all, and she took her water, and we downed it, and we shook hands, and that was the end of the, the, end of the question. And so we had to figure it out, and all of that maneuvering is a really big deal. And I think, so, so, so to make a point, right, so the energy toll is insane when you are performing in spaces that are deeply gendered, or performing in spaces where everybody assumes you're part of the crowd and you're not, um, like everyone else, again, this is a school of fish, right? Everyone else is swimming and you're like a bumblebee underwater, right? You're drowning, you're flapping wings that don't work. So the demand to navigate and to prepare to defend yourself becomes part of how you do business. Um, and, and I don't know if we're going to get to a space anytime soon, at least in my space, where that's going to be anything but true. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a surprise often to your colleagues or to mm. your counterparts, um, the tremendous cognitive and emotional energy it takes to do it uh, when everyone else is just swimming along. So that's, that's one thing I wanted to say. I have two other points before I move forward, which is um, in this field in particular, in cybersecurity in particular, imposter syndrome is crushing. Crushing for probably everybody in this audience. And then if you put a gender layer on top of it, it's unbelievable. My generation of cyber kin, like I said before, are mostly feral. Um, this emphasis on saying that somebody is technical, they're not a technical person, they're not very technical, it's a vicious thing to sling around. I would be very careful with it. If you are interested in technology, if you want to understand how it works, if you want to understand the implications on social systems, you are technical full stop, own that space, don't let anyone tell you you're not. Um, and then, uh, and just sort of the pressure to kind of be what someone tells you it looks like, what does a cybersecurity person look like, that it's, it's really intense, and so just sort of give yourself some grace there. Um, and then any, if, if you are anything but 
it's for me sort of coming into this space, and I was always a raft and treehouse girl. Um, very, so more interested in, in getting uh, scrapes on my knees. But so if you're if you're any kind of mixed anything, if you're if you're a if you're a, a, a female who identifies as female but per, but struggles to perform femaleness, right? This is really hard. And so to sort of have a little grace and recognize when your colleagues around you might be having a different experience. Now the good news is this: if you've gotten this far, you probably really really love the problem set you're working on, and you're in the right space. I can think of no other reason and why you would continue to do it. Um, because for most of us, even though they say this is a highly sort of, you can make a high salary in cyber, can you? Um, and so like not everybody's making a lot of money either. So, um, but, but like sort of be kind to each other. Um, but it's, you know, we're here, we're, we're here to talk about cybersecurity, why it's consequential and why it's consequential to be thoughtful about diversity and gender and all of these questions. And so um, we'll go to our first key message, I guess, which is that when we think narrowly about what cybersecurity and what security means when we think narrowly, when we approach it from one perspective, we obviously create vulnerabilities, right? Um, so what is a gendered lens? So let's, let's take it from a gendered lens. And what does a gendered lens do for thinking about cybersecurity? And I think you had a couple examples if you wanted to go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe just ask a personal question. Do people in this room use dating apps? I, I do. OK, OK, I'm not alone. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, the reason I'm asking is like dating app, right? It sounds like a very innocuous, like meant to be helpful technology, right? Uh, you do share a lot of personal information or as much personal information as you want to share on them. Um, but they, they, they can be used to entrap people in ways that are often heavily gendered. Um, and it's not just here always about women. Also, in countries in the world where it is not OK to be gay, where it's not OK to be queer, uh, authorities and police are using dating apps regularly, and this is widely known and acknowledged and reported on, to lure people into meeting up in person, where sometimes they're faced with physical violence, and other times they're faced with imprisonment. And this is a great example of, of how a technology that we think is, is meant to be helpful, it's innocuous, but it's being misused in ways that are very dangerous, and that danger is heavily gendered. And also, it goes beyond the personal as well. Um, I think there's a lot of ramifications for professional life and also for political life. Um, back in 2020, I co-authored a report um, with a woman who worked at the, the Association for Progressive Communications. Now she's at Human Rights Watch. And we were talking about why gender matters in international cybersecurity. And we, one of the parts of the report that we looked into, we looked into um, how doctored images um, are being used to discredit women who have careers in public service. Um, a lot of those images will depict the women as, as naked, other times maybe involved in a sexual encounter. Um, and there's a report that the Interparliamentary Union put out around 2018, 2019, about the online abuse of women parliamentarians worldwide. And they found that they surveyed women in 39 countries and 81.8% of them had been subjected to various forms of psychological violence online, and 41.8% of that involved extremely humiliating or sexually charged images. Another 44% were also threatened with death, rape, beatings, or abductions. But as a result of things like this happening, it's forcing women and other minorities to not get into public life. It's having knock-on effects for democracy and for representation. And so while, well, again, I think we think that this is not going to be um, harmful or that it might only have a personal impact, and not to minimize the personal impact, there are broader ramifications that we're not always thinking about or aware of. And there's also, and maybe this is getting a bit maybe outside the scope of, of what many of you are working on, but there is a lot of growing research about the gendered impact of internet shutdowns and limitations and restrictions. So, you know, as, as Nina said, how and why people use and can access the internet is also very gendered. And so when it gets turned off, women, men, gender diverse people are going to be differently impacted. Um, so, for example, in some countries, it's not uncommon that women are more likely to be earning income through the informal economy. And an important lifeline for doing that is using online apps that will facilitate shopping, selling, um, and ones that are more easily used on mobile devices instead of laptops. 
And in one country that imposed limitations earlier this year uh, in the wake of protests, there was, of course, an economic impact of all people living there, but it was found that women were disproportionately affected because 64% of the businesses on, in this case, the app that they investigated was Instagram, were women owned. And so this is meant to show that it's, it's not that only women are suffering, but that there is a differentiated and a gendered impact that, again, is maybe not always visible or always top of mind. And I don't think we can fix all of the above with one simple solution. Of course, these are very complex problems. They owe to a lot of varied cultural and political realities. Um, but I want to just take it back you know, to our message, or to what Nina said as our first key message, that if we think narrowly about security, we're going to create vulnerabilities. And by considering gender, we can better help to reduce or even potentially eliminate those vulnerabilities. And one way to consider gender better is to just have better gender diversity in the teams in which we're working in. So, um, so let's move to the second key message, which is that um, leveraging a little bit more of what is approximately just over 50% of the world's population is probably a good idea. Um, there is never enough, there are never enough defenders uh, in cybersecurity, never enough. Like they're just, you know, how many do you need? I need all of them. I need as many as I can get. And so figuring out how do we, how do we maximize the opportunity for many, many more women would be a great idea uh, for many more, many, many more countries, many more anything. And so right now, um, and, and you know, if, if you want to groan along with statistics as well, right? So we've got about 19% uh, of computer science degrees were awarded to women in 2016, which is down from 27% in 97. Like we're going in the wrong direction, like totally wrong direction when it comes to even STEM education. Right? You've got half of the world's population doing so little of science, technology, mathematics, engineering, um, for no knowable reason, right? For no knowable reason other than these existing pathways, the ways in we get, the ways in which women or those who are diverse or people from different countries, the way you're set on a path to get an education, which is usually the pathway into how you get here. Some of us find our way there eventually. Um, we've got to figure that out. We've got to figure out how to sort of do more, not just in the United States, um, but in particular in the United States or in the, in the sort of the global north, if you will, right? The, even the salary differentiation is, is, right, is a little bit awkward. Um, so on average, uh, the average median salary in the United States is about $66,000 a year for women and about $90,000 for men in these fields. And so figuring out how to get through and kind of break through the systemic long-term issues, this is what we've got to figure out because there are never enough defenders. Uh, and so we have uh, far more people um, that we can throw at the problem. Um, and we're, and I mean, I, at least I think, right, we're made better by doing it. Yeah. Um, when we were uh, preparing for, for today, I came across a quote um, from the Cybersecurity Tech Accord. They did a series of social media promotions around International Women's Day, which is on March 8th. Um, and this is from the Women for Cyber Foundation. Ensuring diversity of backgrounds and experiences of cybersecurity professionals is vital in a world where threat actors are extremely skilled and evolve every day. No one perspective is sufficient to provide answers to today's challenges. And when gender is a factor in narrowing the pool of people pursuing cybersecurity careers, we exacerbate the already problematic shortage of cybersecurity skills. And maybe just to you know, sort of chip in a little bit from some examples from the, the world of, of cyber diplomacy and, and policy making, I spend a lot of time, probably too much time at the United Nations, <laughs> um, which you know, I think we all know moves glacially in, in relation to the pace of which technology moves. Um, but no, there's, uh, yeah, so the same report that I did a couple years ago on why gender matters in international cybersecurity, we also wanted to speak with, um, with women diplomats who were kind of you know, mid-career, working in their foreign service on cybersecurity issues. For some, they were also working on other topics, had their files, um, but they're the ones kind of coming out to the UN meetings on cyber norms, international law, et cetera. And yeah, so we did a round of interviews, and most of them you know, didn't really describe necessarily having 
specific concrete stories about barriers to getting into their roles or even maybe necessarily about getting into the right educational stream. Um, but virtually all of, the, all of them talked about the invisible or the less visible discrimination that they face in their roles. And whether that was, you know, one person told a story about where um, they were in a meeting with a male colleague, they suggested an idea at the table, um, it wasn't really heard, and then their male colleague said basically the same thing but slightly different, and then suddenly it was taken up. Um, another very senior woman uh, from a country, I won't give countries, um, she told me about how she had a, a junior male colleague, and whenever they would go in to meet with like ambassadors, et cetera, uh, she was always just automatically assumed to be the more junior colleague uh, by virtue of being a woman. And then another thing that came out of that was that um, someone felt very strongly that the only way she could be heard in a meeting, and I was, you know, your story about the, the US Chinese. Um, uh, naval encounter, uh, it reminded me of, of so many different diplomatic and inter intergovernmental meetings that I've been in where, where you do have these quite heavily male-dominated situations. And uh, one of the interviews, she, she really felt that the only way that she could be heard in those meetings is to mimic what is traditionally considered male behavior. She didn't speak loudly, speak aggressively, put her hand up a lot. She was just going to be invisible. And I think it's, it's interesting to think about how the room that we're in shapes our behavior versus our behaviors shaping the room. And I think this brings home as well the point or the case for diversity in that less diverse spaces are going to be more prone to staying that way because people who are different, whether it's because of your gender, your age, your race, you're going to stay away. You know, we all, people don't like to go where you feel like you're going to be different or you're going to be othered in some kind of way. And so this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Yeah, you're reminding me of a, um... I'm not going to name which office. It's been a while, so but it's not been that long. And um, it's the Department of Defense, right? It's full of it's full of it's just a lot of uh, a lot of masculinity, a lot of expectations around performing in those. And in, in, it's very gendered in the sense that the people who do certain kinds of jobs um, tend to be women or tend to be minority or tend to be, right? So just, it's just sort of an assumption that people walk around with and, um, and it's nice to have allies in the space. And so not super long ago, I'm sitting in a sort of among my colleagues and the staff are there and we're working through some questions together and a, and a um, sort of, I forget where they were from, it was some industry Executives and they wander into the into the space and we're all working on something in the the industry executive the, it, It's only men. There's only men in the room. There's only men. It's just men, men and me right? And so and there are but there are all kinds of men like there are like You know 22 year old men and like 65 year old men and there's like there's like african-american males And there's like people people from other country. We're all there right, but then there's me and so the executive and I'm not joking walks in with a little stack here goes all the way to the back where I am, right? And I'm way in the back. And walks over and goes, could you, could you, could you make some copies? <laughs> and at that point, my colleagues stand up, all of whom are um, executive assistants or, right, they, they are the executives, and they stand up, and my, my, one of my dearest colleagues turns to me, and he goes, <clears throat> Dr. Collars is the advisor to the under I will be handling those copies for you. And it was just, it was a jaw-dropping moment. And we all just sort of looked around. And we, nobody knew what to do. Right? Everybody was shocked. This had just happened. And I was like, no. And I said, no, I'll make coffees. It's fine. But, but you, the, the, the structure, the yeah, architecture yeah. of the place you're in, you, the, they, didn't, you know, they were just as mortified. right? They were just as mortified as my, as my colleagues were. It was just sort of laid bare. right? They just assumed that the Asian female would be the executive assistant. And it was like, oh boy, this is uh, awkward. Um, so, but I mean, it was good. It sort of bought me some <clears throat> advantages later on in negotiation. But that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is sort of knowing, no, you're sort of recognizing when it's there, recognizing when the architecture of the space is not where you want to be, right? I can see that we have these gaps. Let's work on it. And so, anyway, so that's where we are. And so um, that was our second point. And then the, yeah, yeah. So our third point, and it's shorter, and I know everyone's getting edgy. Um, 
which is that this is a global affair. So global STEM migration to include global cybersecurity migration is a real thing. And I look at this room and I see it. And I'm also just continually embarrassed that, you know, that I speak barely two languages. And this room has easily 30. Um, and so I promised my office that I would talk a little bit about what, what it, it, and you can hate the US Department of Defense if you want to. I sort of hate what we have to do. I really, honestly, I hate what we have to do. Um, but like anybody else, the Department of Defense uh, needs more smarter, better people with good judgment. We have a fundamental problem hiring a STEM workforce. It's unbelievable how hard it is to get incredibly the, the world's top scientists and engineers. Because guess what? They're not, you know, they're not interested in working for stodgy old DoD. And so one of the one of the main components of our new strategy is get after the workforce, find the value proposition, help grow a community, not just domestically but globally. Our allies need that workforce as well. They need. Right? They have to make a value proposition. They have to help grow. Right? So part of what we're trying to do under um, Honorable Shu is to say, where are the opportunities? How can I help pay for your education? How can I help grow you? Uh, and industry's doing it too, right? But I just want to just be clear. Like, we see the problem, and we're going to try and get there with you. Um, so if you have any questions about that, I can talk to you about how the Department of Defense can help uh, pay for your education, um, or your respective home countries can help try and pay for some of the cost, because it is expensive. Um, do you have any extra points on that one? No, I don't think so. All right. Um, so I think, I think that's where we are. Um, open the floor to Yeah, we were, we were told an hour. Uh, we didn't want to speak at you the whole time. So uh, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> <clears throat> I can ask myself questions. There they go. OK. We'll take a turn. Tap dance a little bit. So as a, as a male colleague of females, I sometimes think that my role is to help defend, but it's not. How do I, what sort of things should I be looking at as ways to rebuild some of the structures around me, some of the assumptions around me, to make that easier, to make you, your position easier? And take one at a time. Gonna, or? You know, oh, should we just we'll, we'll take one at a time. Go ahead. Yeah. Then, um, I mean, I, I think I think that notion of, of needing to defend is is a quite common one, right? Uh, and I think maybe a, a first way to start maybe un unlocking or thinking differently about that is women don't always need defending. You know, we we have agency and we have strength, and maybe we don't have the same strength as as men or all males, um, but we we don't always need that defending. So thinking differently about that, but also, you know, speaking with other men and, and being an ally can also be a powerful way to, to help. Also, the, I'm 100% certain that we have a panel coming up that can help sort of, there's there, the, the, stay tuned. Um, yes, stay tuned. <laughs> I think, uh, for me, I think it, it, the rooms are always loaded with assumptions. Even, even men amongst men, the room is loaded with assumptions. And I think just sort of being careful or asking or just being thoughtful about, I've just made an assumption that everybody in this room might be binary. I've just made an assumption. And then just ask. Did I just screw that, right? Did I just screw that up? I'm super sorry. Um, and, and sort of just so advance with humility um, yeah. and see, and then just listen. Listen and see what's going on. Was that, was that uncomfortable? OK, sorry about that. And then try and work on it. But, yeah, uh, but but the, the panels to follow today will have will have like sort of hard and fast like sort of good management rules and then and that should sort of give you good guardrails. Yeah. Ooh, get moody Ooh. in here. Why did you go in there? Now that we've, now that we've we shrouded say? you in darkness, the anonymity is wonderful. Uh, you in the distance. Nadia. Thanks. Um, firstly, I sorry, I'm over here. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hello. Uh, I'm Nadia from New Zealand. I wanted to say thank you for doing this talk. I know sometimes being asked to do a speech about being a woman in tech is fraught because it automatically kind of others you. But it is amazing to have my experiences echoed from from people in the industry up there. So thank you so much. Um, one of my questions, Dr. Collins, you talked about some of the issues with with salary differentiation and, and all of the different challenges that we find in the industry. 
How do we fix them? You know, we, I, I represent a lot of forums and we cannot figure out how to get young women into the industry in the first place. I was wondering if you've had any kind of wins or... Yeah, um, so the, um, the, there's no, right, there's no silver, silver, silver bullet. You'd think a Department of Defense person could say that better. There's no silver bullet here. What, what I found has been particularly powerful for anybody who's in this space um, is, so looking for help from above is good. It's very good, and I think people are earnest in their attempt to work on it. But what I have found deeply, deeply satisfying and um, weirdly powerful is um, working horizontally and then helping my colleagues who were juniors to me. It's very interesting that when you, when you see talent that is not being recognized, and then you, it's not, you know, it's not you, right? And you see talent that's not being recognized, and you, you elevate them, and you, you try and grow them or help them into a position. And if you do enough of that, what happens over maybe a year or two is that they start pushing, right, you into new spaces. And so, honestly, I think no matter where you are in your career, pushing your colleagues forward the ones that are junior to you, the ones at the same level as you are, has been more, more useful and empowering to me than anything else. When there's a position that opens in any of my shops, I think to myself, okay, which of, the, which of my junior colleagues that I have met over the last decade would be awesome for this? Right? Who's, and then advocate, advocate. And it's been more, um, it's been more powerful, I think, than then, um, and, his, and sort of helps lean into what leadership is trying to do already. Right? You're helping them try and realize the thing, but they, you know, they don't know. They don't know, you know, they don't know anybody, and so, but you do. So, um, so always be thinking, I always think about who in, my, who in my network should be here. Who needs to be here that isn't here right now? And I can already think of a few, so the next uh, first conference, uh, I'm, I've got a good handful of folks and, and, some, and some really um, awesome African colleagues, by the way, so we'll, we'll get there. Serge. Thanks. When I read the newspaper, it's quite often interviews with new kind of leaders, CEOs, politicians, and with men, the question is always, what are your mentors and stuff like this? With women, it's usually, how do you manage kids and the career? Mm -hmm. And it seems mm. to me this is the, I mean, first of all, this is wrong to have different sets of questions, but what bothers me much more is that we still have this implicit <laughs> notion that, that women have to kind of figure out how they have a career and a family. But we never ask the question, how do couples or families figure out how to have a career and a family? It's, so what I'm often missing is kind of this uh, joining efforts to get there. I mean, that women are disadvantaged is not necessarily a woman's problem. It's, a man's problem, how do we get this alliance together and we, what can we do about this? I also don't have a silver bullet uh, answer, but no, but it's, it's a great question and I think it, it kind of goes back to, to what we said earlier that this is not just a women's problem to solve, it's, it's an everyone's problem. Um, I, late last year, I was doing a little bit of research um, for a report that I wrote. Um, this is not about cyber, it's about chemical weapons. Uh, for the Organization of the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, uh, and it was about gender diversity um, within the OPCW, within the Secretariat, but also amongst the uh, government officials who go there to do things. And this like exact point came up so many times that, you know, like yeah, the 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 burden of care is is traditionally expected to fall to women, or they're being asked to find the solutions and solve the problems for it. And some of the conversations that we had with the organization were like, what more can the organization do? Can they, um, can they initiate different policies? Can they offer care on site? Are there, are there sort of like things that they can do from the employer side? I don't think that that's all of the answer necessarily. I think it's an important part of it. Um, but even, I think even just your asking this question today kind of helps start that conversation along. I think. Um, so for those of you who find yourselves, and maybe you don't want this, uh, but you find yourself in a management role, um, when those people you supervise, this, if you can start working that into how you have your meetings, 
is a really smart way to move. Um, so it's not, it's not, oh no, what if, what if she decides to have a baby? That's not the question, right? That's not the, if, you, if that's where you're at, you, you are, you're behind the, you're, behind, you're too late. What, what, what you need to be having conversations about when you have your staff meetings is, hey, do we have a lactation space? Do we have, do we have time in the days? Is, is our work schedule and the way we do meetings, does it leave time for a person to go into a private space for 20 or 40 minutes? And, and if you don't, if you aren't having those structural pace of the day, what is my building look like conversations, then you are accidentally hostile, right? You're accidentally hostile and you don't know it. And so being thoughtful about what would a person and, the, and by the way, this is this is like a not a new conversation, um, or, or you know, and and or who you know, maybe we have people who are differently abled, maybe we have people who have language or hearing limitations. These are this is what a, this is what a leader does. This is what a manager does. Right? It doesn't just optimize performance and make sure the tickets get done, right? But you have to be having these other human conversations. You have to think about the humans you're supervising, and you have to try and anticipate where we are going, and you have to have that conversation mm -hmm. first. You can't wait for it to happen. You can't be reactive because you've accidentally created a hostile. Situation. So, sort of think about it, right? Gosh, we'll walk through this space. Is there, a, is there a lactation space anywhere nearby? Can someone take 20 minutes of their day, and right, just ensure that they can feed their own baby? Um, <laughs> so these are like thoughts, right? Yeah. Meeting, meeting times. Also, I was working for oh. a little while in a, in a, in like an informal working group, and it was mainly women with children, and they had to go to school, you know, by kind of 3:30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon to do the school pickup. Um, and someone else was trying to set up a standing meeting time around that same time of day. So it's just like small adjustments like that that, that can make things different. Yeah. yeah. You'll retain your people better if you do it that way. Your, your, your previous answer was about promoting talent, et cetera. The next question is coming from someone that I hired a while ago and whose presentation yesterday was far better than I could ever do. Uh, Rebecca. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to adjust this. Hi, folks. I'm Rebecca Henry from the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. Truly, really wonderfully hired by Ted. Um, okay, so your last answer actually really shoehorns well into what I'm going to ask now. As a young adjacent person uh, in STEM, one thing that I've encountered is that I've seen um, a lot of focus on climbing the hill in STEM to get to your first career job mm. or get to your first opportunity. Mm. But I find that the focus on that sometimes is almost misleading. We focus too much on getting people to their first job, and we don't focus enough on providing the supports needed to allow you know, gender diverse individuals, diverse individuals of all different like, I don't know, skill sets to stay the course for the long term in their career. So I wanted to ask you, and hopefully you can elaborate on this, how do you leverage communities of support in your career and also in your life um, to allow you to maintain a safe space to talk about these struggles that you encounter on a daily basis, talk about the microaggressions, talk about the structural issues, and really affirm your lived experience in tech. <laughs> you swallow it and just keep it right here and never tell anybody, right? That's a terrible <laughs> idea. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it's whatever. So we're we're all going through very different things, and it's whatever gets you through. So so first, avail yourself of every resource that you can think of. I have, you know, sort of when I finally joined and gave up and just sort of decided like, okay, look, I need, to, I need an actual tribe to hang with. You know, I, need, I, can, I can be in my workspace, I can do my guns and bombs things, but I need a tribe that understands me, that's listening to me, that, right? And so when I have them and they're, they're there for me whenever, you know, whenever I need, you know, just pull open signal and start, you know, start complaining. And so that is, um, that, that's proven invaluable over and over again, um, having, um, Navigating and defending is tiring, and making sure that you have people to talk to um, is is and and I'm you know I'm sort of fortunate, right? I'm I'm I've come to a part of my career where I'm not constantly doubting whether or not I actually know anything and whether or not I suck, you know, like I suck, it's terrible, um, and and so I'm so it's been easier, um, but you know it's it's every which way. 
I can think of, and if, and if, if you're looking for people to support you, you know, sort of come find other people who are willing to st stand up on a stage for an hour, uh, and, and we'll see if we can find you a place. But it's really about finding a Sherpa or, or, or a guide or, you know, name your, name your referent. And having, and it doesn't work the first time. You you make you may go into some communities, and you may be like, "This is not for me. It's not for me, man. Right? I can't do it." Um, uh, and then you, eventually, you find your way into a space where you're like, "I'm good. I feel protected. Um, where I can sort of be rage filled, um, and 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 then go to my work on Monday and be like, "Let's do this. We got. I got this. Right? It'll be fine." Um, but having it in your work, I can't say enough. Having it in your workspace, having leaders in your workspace who are there trying to help you, even if they, even if it's not successful, it's it's working for me now, right? But like I've had leaders over which they're trying to help, but it doesn't work. You know, it's really easy to get mad at them, um, but but they're trying, and so just you know keep swinging at it. Do you have do you have thoughts there? No, I, I completely agree. I think I think I've also been fortunate. Like I've worked a lot of my career in uh, in civil society and NGO organizations, which uh, like they have problems too, of course. Um, but I think especially over the the years that I was working uh, with like a very lefty feminist organization, there was I think just a lot of sort of built in care and and support in that. But some of the um, spaces where we we operate, and certainly if you're working on disarmament, weapons issues, security, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a, this whole other energy <laughs> when you go into those rooms. Um, and so I think I, I felt lucky that when I would go somewhere and I would have maybe a negative experience, I would have great colleagues, you know, to, to back me up. And even, you know, last week I was um, speaking at an event in, in Geneva, and I was speaking from a paper that, that I wrote, like the whole 50 pages of it, so I, I knew it inside and out. Um, and afterwards, someone came up to me and he, he wants to tell me like other things about it. <laughs> I think we've all been in that situation, right? And um, and you know, of course, you're, you're you're being polite and you're trying to like you know you hear what they have to say. You don't know what they have to say. Maybe it's it's going to be good feedback. Um, and it just kind of it continued. It continued all the way to the lunch buffet. It continued through the lunch buffet line. At some point, I kept being like, I need to I need, I need to go now. Um, and just having like other people, colleagues who kind of you know kind of came, not came in to rescue, but who could kind of like see what was going on and. Um, talk with you about that afterward was, was nice. Thanks. Thank you for this um, talk. My name is Demetria, and I'm from the Bahamas. And currently, I am the newest National CERT manager. But I want to talk about cybersecurity awareness, or information security awareness, and representation, and how that shift culture. And so I'll give you a little short story. In my previous employment, I, in one circle, hired three analysts, and they were all women. And my leadership team came to me and said, we didn't have any males apply. And uh, I had hired before, and I had hired all men before, and nobody asked me a question. But this time around, mm -hmm. they were curious about me hiring three women. Was it intentional? Well, who knows, huh? okay. And uh, so I said, what do you think a cybersecurity professional looks like? And the reason why I am bringing that up is because when I look at, we talk a lot about changing culture and cybersecurity awareness, but I don't see a lot of that content in our cybersecurity awareness feed. I don't see us saying, this is what we look like. When we talk about it, when we share it, we don't show. So then we don't then, and I'm talking to us women, we, then, we don't get the sponsorship from the tune at the top that will help to shift this idea that anyone joining or in this space is male or a man. Uh, and so therefore, when you're seeing groups of women in a team, you're, you're certainly, you think that's odd. What I'm hoping to get and I know I should be asking a question, but I'm certainly... No, that's fine. Keep going. What I'm hoping to, to ask is, how do we change the tune at the top and we change the content of cybersecurity awareness to ensure, to include representation? Like, there's a person like me, and like you, but also include it for women. Because what's happening is, I don't see us representing women and our content so that when we... And we are giving awareness sessions, what, once a month? 
we send out something once a month in these organizations, mm -hmm. and no one is seeing women in that content, and therefore leadership isn't pushing the idea, or they don't even think that women should be in this space, simply because as professionals, we don't show women in, in, in these roles. Somewhere in there is the question. Mm. <laughs> This is a fundamental, you know, the mm -hmm. department, so the <laughs> militaries are having this conversation constantly, right? How do we shift the culture? How do we figure it out? Um, sort of, as, as a, in the United States, we have a, it's a volunteer uh, service, right? And, they, and there are fewer and fewer uh, United States citizens who want to, want to serve in the military and Part of me is like, well, maybe we're, maybe we're growing up. But part of me is like, no, we actually need, uh, you know, I, I'm from the position, right? This is funny because when we met each other, we're like, wow, totally different backgrounds. <laughs> um, uh, but um, it's not enough to, I think, one, I think storytelling is incredibly important in this space. I think you, if, you don't, if you don't attach it to a story, if you aren't <clears throat> telling people what it feels like, it's not going to stick. You can say it, they're going to be like, yeah, yeah, I did the online training, <laughs> right? Um, um, but I think, I think helping to humanize and personalize it, I, I think, for me, is how I try and have that effect. Try and say, wow, it's really interesting that, you know, Room is predominantly male again, uh, and um, and and try and sort of jolly people. It's and again every every tool in the in the toolbox. You have to use them all. Um, so it's not just have the awareness training. Um, you do have to have people asking, "Hey, where's that? Where's that diversity statement? Or have we moved that along?" Um, you know, wow, that last slate of candidates you brought. Um, do, you know, can, can we can we relook at the pool to see to see if we've if we've tried to capture diversity of experience? If we if we found diversity of perspective, like keep keep chasing it. And what you know, they, here's what they're not going to do: they're not going to fire you. Uh, and so that you know, this, the, everyone's managers and companies are desperate to figure out how to do this. So you know, help them keep the conversation going, um, you know, do whatever you can. Um, but yeah, this is, and then and don't let people poison the effort by saying, wow, why, well, you know, you only picked women. That seems like you might be like, yeah, fine, just poison the conversation. Clearly there's, right, like wh where are we in the balance of things, folks? Uh, yeah, you know, you picked too many women. F uh, fine, you know, uh, I'm okay with that. So don't let them poison your effort by saying you're overdoing it. It's, there's, it's impossible. It's impossible. Sixteen percent of the of the computer science degrees in the United States go to women. Come on, you know, like it's a very serious problem. So no, I'm not. Try, I'm not trying too hard. Keep going. Yeah, and I was just, I was kind of reminded of like with that story. Um, you know, everyone's heard about like, like man panels, right? Where you have like all men speaking on the panel. Um, and you know, I think in some recent efforts to correct that, at least in some of the conferences I've been to, you end up with like all women panels, and then you never invariably hear somebody say, "Well, then that's not good either." And maybe there there is an argument to that. But to going back to what you said about 51% of the population, it's, it's not a small amount of the population. Um, and I think also like the visibility part of it that you that you mentioned as well. Like even my coming here to speak today, I won't. Um, mentioned who it was who, who suggested me for this or recommended it, but I was, I was nervous. I am, I am nervous, you know, I, I've not been in one of these conferences before. I don't have a, a technical background per se. Um, and what they said to me was, but it's, it's important to see women who do what you do up on a stage talking about it. And I was like, okay, if, if, if that's how you feel. But I think things like this, um, you know, they, they breed other opportunities. And then just kind of a last thing, I think, Having a leadership, a leader who's a, who's a champion for this is hugely important, but leadership comes and goes and it changes. So I think it also needs to somehow become more ingrained and baked into workplace culture and policies um, in case that person does move on. Okay, we've got five minutes oh, left. We've got okay. three speakers. Let's try 1.6 minutes each. Let's go. <laughs> got it. Uh, hi, thank you for doing the talk. It's a really important uh, topic here. Um, when we talk about uh, diversity and inclusion, I think uh, a lot of things are, uh, or some things are visible. You can probably tell my gender and uh, uh, skin color, Caucasian, uh, maybe have a good guess about my age. Uh, a lot of things are invisible. Um, sexuality, um, maybe physical uh, disabilities, mental disabilities. Um, do you have any th thoughts on that? How, how we do a better effort in 
and do inclusion uh, all across the, the board or, or know of any interesting stuff going on in the, in the cyber community mm -hmm. in, in that regard? Not off the top of my head, I can't, I can't think of anything that I'm aware of that's going on. I mean, I think, yeah, it's tough, right? Because some of the things maybe you do need to ask about, but then you kind of wander into territory that isn't always okay from an HR perspective. So, I don't know, Nina. I mean, so, uh, yeah, so there's the, there's the rules, so there's the policies with your organizations, but then there are the sort of, the, this is the, the, the really uncomfortable like, culture question. Mm. I think, I think um, you know, having come through a pandemic, we suddenly became aware of some of us are having different experiences about what it's like to get sick, right? Different bodies, different immune systems, and some people are still wearing masks, and that's, you know, and they're coming through it thinking, okay, maybe it's still okay for me to wear my mask, and I hopefully we've landed in a space in the United States where, you know, it's still okay, you can do it if you want to. You know, no one's going to look at you weird, or at least even if they do, they're not going to say it to your face. Hopefully, hopefully. Um, so I think we're, we're, I think we're progressing in that way. I will, I will sort of do a mega shout out to FIRST for the TLP wristbands. Phenomenal. Just want to sort of give you a round of applause for this. The sort of, and if you haven't seen the TLP wristbands, go back to the registration desk. There's a wristband, right? You can wear the green, which is, I'm cool with handshakes. Let's do this, right? I might even hug, you know? And, um, and then there's like the, hey, I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable here. And that's not just about immune systems. That's about, you know, sort of, what is probably true for a good number of us in the room, which is that we are, some of us are very introverted, some of us are being forced to perform socially, and that's fine, but like, I need space, I need quiet, I need, what do I need to be, right? It's not just about like helping people, it's about trying to get them into a position where they are at their best, where they're performing. And if you don't create an environment where that's, then you're, you're paying someone to do less than what they, right? So you need to like create this environment where like, wow, I'm really excelling in this space. I have been made comfortable. I'm going to knock it out of the park today. And, and so trying to be thoughtful about when and how you're feeling that. Um, helping your leadership understand that you're better, you're better at your job when you're that way. Like, that's just good management, right? That's just, like, if you're, if you're an ROI person, return on investment, then do it that way. But um, just being, finding ways for people to perform at their best is full stop what we should be thinking about. Yeah, so, yeah, and, and, like, and I'll probably, like, once we're done here, I'll run directly off stage because I'm, like, massively introverted, and so it's, like, I'll, <laughs> I'm going to go to my room, and I'll, I'll show up later on, but I, I just need, like, an hour to kind of, like, do this. Um, so just thank you in advance for that. <laughs> okay, we've theoretically got a minute left, so I'm not sure. No, sorry, we'll get, sorry, sorry. I don't know if we'll get to we'll here. Sweep through, sweep we'll, through, we'll, sweep through the questions. We'll see how fast we'll, we go. Yeah. All right, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Tom Longstaff, Software Engineering Institute. Thank you both, by the way, for boldly really sharing your insights and your stories. That's really important, and thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go a slightly different direction. I'd like to get your insight perspective on the last two years of COVID. How did that change, if at all, the relationship that we have between gender identity and, and participation and inclusion? Was it helpful? Was it not helpful? What were your personal insights based on that? And then can, can we just take the second question also so we yeah. get all the questions on the floor? All right, I'll, I'll pick it up later on. It's fine. It's, <laughs> it's, it's quite extended, so no worries. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to say COVID was a negative impact on diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, I think, you know, for a whole lot of reasons that probably we've all read about in different places and spaces. I think the you know, children being out of school meant people were able to work less, often just because of how society is set up, that meant women were working less. So I think there was a big step backward. Uh, we know that physical violence uh, was very much domestic violence, and personal violence was on the rise during COVID. Um, but I, I also am trying to answer, also answer quickly, <laughs> so I'm glossing over some things. I was also kind of taken about what you just said about how it did, um, it did make all of us think more about different people's comfort levels with things and like what we have going on inside that maybe isn't always visible to everyone else, right? Like whether it's that you're scared, that you've had a bad day, um, and that's why you're acting strangely, that you have an immune issue that makes you more likely to catch COVID or become very sick with COVID. So I want to say that maybe in all of that, there was some um, making us more conscious of, of one another and, and needing to be a little more plugged in, a little more tuned in. I don't know if that's true for everyone in the world, but I want to think that for many of us, that that has been the experience. 
we can continue this conversation yes. off yeah. the stage as well, but I just want to say that, yeah, the, when I, one of the things that I think I did appreciate about uh, sort of those of us who live on the internet um, was that there were a suite of tools that I became aware of and that we all became aware of new ways to communicate so that my, um, so that my vision impaired and my uh, hearing impaired colleagues, it made it a little bit easier in some yeah. cases and harder than others. Um, but that chat box was my favorite part of the entirety of COVID because people would put the wrong chat in the wrong place and it was just endlessly entertaining. So there was that. Yeah. Allison's going to be here until tomorrow and need it till Friday. If people want to stop and ask them questions and carry on the conversation, I'm sure they'd be more than pleased. Um, please, a great round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.